everyone can hear me, right? Too, too well? Let me, let me turn this down a little bit. Really? I'm going to turn this down a little bit. I'll try to project. So, I need a screwdriver to do this? Alright, how's that? How's that? Okay, okay, good. Okay, so uh, this talk is about graph grammars and automata for natural language processing. It's a pretty theoretical talk. If you're used to seeing an experiment slide at the end of the talk, uh, don't hold your breath, there isn't one. Um, but uh, I figure it's good to give some practical motivation before diving into the theoretical stuff. So how many people have watched the, uh, the contest between IBM Watson and the uh, Jeopardy champions? Uh, about half of you. Okay. Um, so uh, if, if you aren't aware, uh, Watson is a supercomputer developed by IBM to play uh, the TV game show Jeopardy. Jeopardy is a trivia contest where you're given answers and you're supposed to uh, provide the questions that match the answers. And um, just as a showcase, IBM actually decided to, to show on Primetime TV uh, an actual contest between their uh, system and the two previous best players of Jeopardy. And so uh, I'm going to show you a clip from the final Jeopardy round of the, I believe, the first day of this contest. I think it was a series of two, two contests. And um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just let the video go, and I hope it's not too loud. No? It was like ear shattering into that before. It's second largest for a World War II battle. 30 seconds clear, so good luck. It's like all or nothing. Okay, so its largest airport is named for a World War II hero. Its second largest for a World War II battle. Does anyone, anyone who has not seen this, do you know the answer? I'm sure some of you are saying it, but the room is too big. Uh, so, okay, Chicago is the answer. Uh, so, the biggest airport is O'Hare, and the second largest airport is Big Lake. We come to you, Ken. You have 2400 for this final going in, and you wrote down what is Chicago. That is correct, and you wagered $2,400. That doubles your score. $4,800. Down to Brad now, he had 5,400. I have to feel that he came up with the correct response. Did he? Yes, and the wager? I mean, almost everything you can. $5,000 takes you up to 10,400. Now to our leader, Watson, going into final 36,681. And the response was, what is Toronto? A lot of question marks, which means, of course, that Watson had many, many doubts. And the wager, how much are you going to lose? Oh, you sneak. $957. Okay. So, the category was U.S. cities, and Watson said Toronto was the U.S. city. And um, I guess there's some explanation for how Watson arrived at that answer. But uh, I'd like to just spend a little bit of time thinking about what could Watson have done to um, get this right. And this is not a talk about question answering. I'm not going to tell you how to build a question answering system. But we can look at the information that Watson had available to it and think about how we might get started doing this kind of processing. So uh, among many other things, Watson had stored inside it uh, the entire text of Wikipedia in RAM, not on disk. And um, if you just go to Wikipedia, you'll see that the information is all right there. So if you go to the Wikipedia article for O'Hare Airport, it says Chicago O'Hare International Airport is a major airport located in northwestern Chicago. So uh, O'Hare Airport is an airport in Chicago. And in 1949, it was renamed to honor Edward O'Hare, uh, Medal of Honor recipient in World War II. So Chicago's biggest airport, or a large airport in Chicago, was named after a World War II hero. And then it says, under the article for Midway, it's an airport in Chicago, and in 1949, it was renamed after the Battle of Midway, and the Battle of Midway was one of the most important naval battles of World War II. So all the information's there. It's not like Watson didn't have the right information, which is usually the problem with us. Um, somehow, he or it was not able to assemble this information in the right way to arrive at the correct answer. So what? What further processing would have to happen in order for Watson to make this happen? Um, again, I'm not going to give you a complete answer to this, but for sure, um, uh, we can identify a couple of basic prerequisites in order to make this kind of reasoning happen. 
The first thing is we need to be able to, to identify co-reference. So um, the computer needs to know that O'Hare International Airport is the same thing as the airport in this sentence. Same here. Midway International Airport, the airport. It's pretty obvious to us, less obvious to a computer. Even it's not totally given that this O'Hare International Airport is the same as this O'Hare International Airport. That also has to be uh, inferred, but of course that's much easier. Um, and what else? Chicago and the city and so forth and so forth. So we, you know, we, we, need to, we need to know that there are different expressions in these sentences that actually refer to the same thing. And that's an absolute prerequisite for, prerequisite for starting to reason about uh, what these sentences say about those things. Right? Okay, another thing. Uh, so this is a little bit more abstract than co-reference for the entities in the sentence. We need to realize that was named for is the same kind of action as to be renamed to honor and to rename after. Different words, exact same concept, right? Uh, a little bit harder, is a World War II here the same thing as a Medal of Honor recipient in World War II? Yeah, but you know, that's far from obvious to a, a computer. And uh, is a World War II battle a Mean roughly the same thing as one of the most important naval battles of World War II. Yeah, so this is a more specific kind of this, but this is not going to be obvious to the computer. So uh, we need to have some kind of way of uh, abstracting a little bit about uh, the way the concepts are worded to uh, the concepts themselves. So um, all of the things that are the same color here somehow need to be merged into the same concept. Does that make sense? Okay, so the way that this is usually done is to come up with some kind of a semantic representation. And um, I'm not a semanticist. There are lots of different proposals out there for computational semantics. And uh, I'm just going to talk about a very, very simple one. And if you are a semanticist, then you probably will have all kinds of questions about how this is an, in, an inadequate semantics. But uh, that's okay. We're just hoping that this semantics that we're dealing with here just kind of gets us the basics, and we're not claiming that this is really a full uh, uh, be-all, end-all of semantics. So um, this is actually pretty typical of class semantics, so we can represent the meaning of this sentence. In July 1949, the airport was renamed after the Battle of Midway. We can uh, express it using a logical form that's kind of like this. We have four things, D, A, B, and N. D is a date, and the month is July, and the day is 1949. A is an airport, and specifically it refers to Chicago Midway International Airport. And the string comes from the Wikipedia page for Midway. Uh, B is a battle, and B refers specifically to the Battle of Midway. And N is a naming event, and name02 comes from propping. This is a resource that tells you what are the different senses of the verbs. And name02 specifically refers to the bestowal of a name upon someone, as opposed to like naming a suspect. So name02, uh, N is a name02 event, and the theme or the thing that receives the name is A and the thing that it's named after is B. Okay, so pretty reasonable, I think, semantics for this sentence. Uh, we can represent the exact same logical form as a graph, if you want to. This, this representation is exactly equivalent to the representation I showed you on the previous slide. So in this graph, every single node corresponds to a variable uh, of the logical form, and every edge corresponds to some predicate that's predicated of, uh, of uh, two of the variables. Okay, so we take this graph, it's a direct graph, uh, to be a representation of the meaning of that sentence. It should be an acyclic graph. We've actually built like 20,000 of these, or uh, uh, ISI together with uh, 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 Colorado and some other sites, LDC, have built about 20,000 of these. If you actually look at them, they actually do have some cycles, but we think that those are bugs. And eventually, it, these uh, semantics should all be represented as directed acyclic graphs. Um, and we call these abstract meaning representations. I guess to avoid, I guess semantics is kind of a loaded term, so we call them AMRs, abstract meaning representations. Okay, any questions so far? And feel free to interrupt me at any time. Okay, okay, so we're, we're, we're interested in graphs as meaning representations. Uh, here's a more complicated example. So because, well, this is not, this is a graph that's also a tree, so it's not that exciting. So here's a, an AMR that's uh, quite obviously not a tree. So this is the graph for the sentence. I asked her what she thought about where we'd be, and she said she doesn't want to think about that, and that I should be happy about the experiences we've had, which I am. Uh, it's a great sentence, I love it. Uh, so you can see there's a note here for she, and it's got all these arrows pointing in because she gets mentioned so many times during the sentence. And there's a note here for I, and it has four arrows pointing into it because I gets referred to in the sentence. 
Uh, if you stare at this a while, then you can convince yourself that this graph basically represents the meaning of that sentence. Okay, so, um, in natural language processing, we have really good sets of tools for working with uh, uh, other kinds of objects that are more shallow than semantics. So if you're interested in um, dealing with strings, like you want to do transliteration or entity tagging or things like that, then um, many or even most of the models that do those kinds of tasks are, uh, can be thought of as uh, some kind of a weighted finite state automaton or a weighted finite state transducer. And uh, uh, those form a really good set of tools for dealing with strings. And I'll, I'll give an example later of, of how that works in practice. Uh, we can also use context-free grammars as a mechanism for, for uh, working with strings. If we're interested in trees as uh, representations of syntactic structures of sentences, then we have uh, various kinds of tree automata. Uh, if, if you haven't seen a tree automata before, you could just think of them as context-free grammars. It's just that they are uh, conceived of as tree-generating tree -generating systems rather than string-generating systems. And um, if you want to get fancier, then you can also think about tree rewriting systems like tree adjoining grammars or context free tree grammars. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if you've seen those or not. Tree adjoining grammars, probably. Um, and uh, again, this is a form of really well behaved set of tools that you can assemble together in interesting ways to build um, real applications that do that do powerful stuff with strings and trees. So what this talk is basically about is we'd like to uh, we'd like to to create a set of tools for graphs. Uh, that works as well as uh, finite state automata and finite state tree automata have worked for strings and trees. Because that seems to work pretty well for strings and trees, we'd like to be able to do the same thing for graphs. And uh, we kind of went through the, graph, the, the literature on graphs, and it seemed like the two most promising formalisms that people had proposed back in the 80s were DAG automata, which are like the finite state machine analog for graphs, and hyper edge replacement grammars, which are like the context free grammar equivalent. For graphs, and uh, there seems to be a pretty good analogy uh, uh, between these three columns of the table. Does that make sense? So what I'd like, what I'd like to talk about for the rest of the talk is uh, each of the columns of this table, but especially the third column, and how we might be able to uh, uh, work with these two existing formalisms to make a really practical framework for doing natural language processing on uh, graphs, especially graph representations of the Okay, any questions? Does this sound like a reasonable thing to give a talk about? If not, I'll just stop. Um, <laughs> all right. Okay, so here's a table of, uh, here's kind of a summary of the properties of these different formalisms. Uh, I dropped out trees just because there wasn't enough room on the slide. So you have the two string formalisms, finite state machines and context free grammars, and two graph formalisms, data comma and HRGs. And you can see that there's a bunch of properties, and if it's a yes no question, yes is good and no is bad. So you can see FSAs and CFGs are really good. There's yeses everywhere, almost everywhere. And with the graph formalisms, as of like 2011, there were a lot of no's because these formalisms existed in the theoretical literature and they didn't necessarily think about the same things that, that we think about when we're actually building natural language tools. So there's a lot of no's in here. There's, there's uh, one yes in here. And um, uh, oftentimes the algorithm that people are most interested in is the recognition or parsing algorithm. So given a string, can you decide whether the automaton accepts the string? Given a string, can you decide whether a context free grammar accepts the string? Given a graph, can you decide whether a diagonal accepts that graph? Given a graph, can you decide whether an HRG accepts that graph? So for strings, we have these nice polynomial time algorithms with a very low degree. And for diagonal they just didn't bother to work it out because they had no reason to. Uh, for HRGs, uh, for certain classes of graphs, they said it's polynomial. Uh, but they didn't say, is it n to the 17th or n to the 325? Um, for the theoreticians, it's all p. So they were happy with the p. But when actually implement it, we care very much whether this is n to the 6th or n to the 20th. And um, there are great open source toolkits for FSAs and CFGs. So FSAs like OpenFST, uh, ISI has a toolkit called Mel. There was an older toolkit called the ATT Finite State Toolkit, which I guess is the predecessor of OpenFSD. Um, for CFGs and tree transducers, ISI also has a toolkit called Tiburon. But for graphs, uh, we're not aware of we're not aware of any uh, actually implemented toolkit of that sort. 
Okay, so this is the situation now. So a lot of the no's have been changed into yeses, actually all of them, uh, except for this one. This one still, we don't have fully general transducers, we just have dagger tree transducers. And uh, there was no algorithm here before, but now we have a, a algorithm that looks like it might be linear. It's not really, but I'll explain it later in the talk. And we have an algorithm for HRGs that's not just P anymore, but we actually are able to, to get some kind of a bound on uh, the degree of the polynomial field. And in practice, we think K is actually pretty low. Single digits. I, think I feel pretty safe saying single digits. Um, all right, so that's where we are now. And so I'd like to, I'd like to highlight a couple of these results and uh, I'd be happy to talk afterwards about some of the other results if, you, if you're interested. Okay, so first let's talk about streets. So imagine you're traveling to Japan and you see this sign. What does this sign say? McDonald's hamburgers. Okay, do you speak Japanese? Yeah, okay. So what if you didn't speak Japanese, but you spent a day before, maybe on the airplane, learning the katakana alphabet. Japanese has three uh, alphabets, and uh, this is written katakana, and uh, you could easily learn katakana on an airplane flight uh, across the Pacific. So uh, you were able to sound this out and say, this says, maku do naru do hanbaga. So even if you don't know any Japanese, you can kind of listen to this with this ear and say, oh, this is a McDonald's hamburger, right? Even, even if you're not a Japanese speaker, all you know is the Japanese alphabet. So it turns out that um, Japanese has a lot of, uh, all languages borrow loan words from other languages. It, just, it turns out that Japanese has an unusual number of loan words from English. And when a word gets borrowed from one language to another, it stays roughly the same, but it changes its pronunciation a little bit. I guess English and Japanese, it changes its pronunciation more than a little bit. And humans are pretty good at recovering the original pronunciation. You just listen to with the loose ear. So how might we do this with the computer? And I, I guess there's lots of ways, but uh, I think a very easy to understand way is let's use finite transducers. So we can imagine breaking down this task into three smaller tasks to divide a number. So the first task is to map the katakana onto some kind of a, a phonetic representation. And this is super easy to do with a finite state transducer because this mapping is, as far as I know, completely deterministic. Okay, makes sense so far? And then we can imagine creating another FST that maps from a Japanese pronunciation to an English pronunciation. And this is not as trivial because the mappings are not necessarily one-to-one, -one, but you know, you can imagine making an FST that tries to cover all the possibilities inserts vowels or deletes vowels in the right places, and so forth. Uh, and then we need a third finite state transducer that maps from English pronunciations to uh, English spellings. And the easiest way to do this is you make an FST that represents something like uh, the CMU pronunciation dictionary or something like that, or you could do some fancier kind of graphic defoning thing. But uh, yeah, this, this is also a well understood problem. So we can make FSTs do all three of these things, and the nice property about FSTs is that the composition of any number of FSTs, finite number of FSTs, is also an FST. So even though I don't know how I would write this one big FST, it'd be really complicated, I can write those three smaller FSTs composed together, and I know that there's a single FST that does, that goes straight from Japanese katakana all the way down to English orthography. Okay, so this is the cool thing about FSTs, is that they're composable like this. And uh, the property of composition is closely related to the, uh, the fact that FSAs are closed under intersection. Because if you think about it, if I compose two transducers, I'm really just intersecting out over one of them with the input of the other one, and then kind of hooking them up. So usually, usually when you get intersection closure, you also have composition closure. But go ahead and hit. This diagram is an oversimplification, because this FSC doesn't just map that one string to that one string, it actually maps any number of Japanese strings. In principle, it should be able to map any Japanese a string and attempts to map it onto an English string. Okay, so uh, this is actually more representative of the operation of this FST. But if I actually want to use this to try to decode that one sign, I'm not interested in all those other Japanese strings. So what do I do? I compose the FST again with another FST that only accepts that one string. I'm going to know to know how that. And then the result will be a single FST that accepts one and only one Japanese string but still outputs a bunch of different English streams. These are all the candidate decodings of that Japanese stream. Does that make sense? Okay, and uh, now we have to choose the best one. So uh, all along, I've been assuming that there are weights on the transitions of this finite state automaton, and now uh, the, the higher weight means more likely, and if my model's been designed correctly, McDonald's hamburger should have a higher score than Madonna had that. 
So I need an algorithm that will actually search through the paths of this YSC transducer, and there could be uh, exponentially many of them, exponentially many of them, and I don't want to actually iterate them all, so I need to use some kind of dynamic programming algorithm, namely the Perturbi algorithm, to find the best path through this automaton. Okay, and this is all well understood, we can do this very efficiently, and so select the correct decoder. Okay, any questions? Yes? Uh, I Sorry? The are deterministic, right? They, they're not deterministic. So let's see. In in the first the first stage, the first stage is the first stage is determin deterministic. But these two stages are both non-deterministic. Especially this one. So there are lots of ways of getting from one series of Japanese sounds to a series of English ah. sounds. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. This is yeah, that's non-deterministic too, but not, not so bad. Used this before. That's cool. Okay. Um, all right. So the basic ingredients that we need are um, basic ingredients that we need. We need to be able to define a transducer version of the formalism. We're not just interested in accepting strings. We want to actually do string transformations. That's really important. We need to be able to assign weights or probabilities to the edges. That's really important if we're doing statistical NLP. Um, we need intersection or composition. That's a really important property. And we need to be able to efficiently sum over the derivations of an automaton, or find the maximum weight derivation of an automaton. And if you've been through a class where you talked about semi-rings a lot, then you know that actually those are the same problem under different semi-rings. You put these things together, then you have a recognition of them. And of course, you want it to be accurately implemented. So uh, finite state machines have all of the basic pieces that we need to do really an astonishing variety of natural language processing tasks, just with, just with these, how many? four or five uh, basic properties. Um, really, it's an extremely, extremely flexible framework. Okay, any questions? That's all about strings, and, I'm gonna, and the, the section on trees is super short, and then we'll get to graphs. So suppose we want to translate this Chinese sentence, and the word for word translation for this Chinese sentence is Australia is with North Korea, have diplomatic relations that few countries, one of. And if we did a word-for-word -word translation, this would be a terrible, terrible, terrible translation. The correct translation is Australia is one of the few countries that have diplomatic relations with North Korea. And so you could try to do a finite state transducer that would do this translation, but finite state transducers basically are extremely limited in the kinds of reordering they can do. Um, and so uh, if we want a more satisfying account of how to translate the sentence, it's much nicer to think about a sentence as a tree. Uh, uh, a hierarchically structured collection of phrases. So uh, here's the same Chinese sentence. We can impose a tree structure on it, and it's kind of color coded to show you how the the sisters of the tree rearrange themselves. And the very complicated reordering that has to take place in these Chinese words actually is very simple when you think about it in terms of trees. So you just have to swap the orange node, the two daughters of the sorry, the two daughters of the yellow node, and you have to swap uh, the two daughters of this node. And you have to swap the two daughters of this node, I think. The three swaps. And um, uh, the really complicated reordering actually turns out to be a very simple reordering. What do you think about it in terms of trees? So um, trees are a good thing in natural language processing. And so we'd lots of like a nice set of tools for working with trees. And uh, if we had such a set of tools, and we do, then we can assemble them in a way like this. We can start with a Chinese sentence. Uh, we can parse it using like a, some kind of a string to tree transducer to get a tree. And then we'll apply some kind of tree to tree transducer to get uh, an English tree. And then we want to compose that with a n-ram language model, which is a finite state automaton, to guarantee that the English output is fluent. So we're chaining together three kinds of machines together. You've got one big machine. That's a syntax-based MT system. And um, then you have to do some tricks to make sure that it doesn't run too slow and stuff like that. And then you have to do your binary area training and blah, 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 blah. And then you've got a working syntax-based MT system. But basically, uh, a syntax-based MT system consists of these same basic parts combined using composition and summation and so forth. So uh, context-free grammars and finite tree automata, basically the same thing. Um, again, have these really nice properties. Composition closure, uh, uh, polynomial time recognition, and so forth and so forth. Any questions about that? That's all I have to say about trees. Okay, so, uh, and if you're interested in tree adjoining grammars, yeah, they also have these nice properties, except that parcels, it gets a little bit hard. Okay, so 
and I've graphed them. So here's another uh, uh, AMR, like the ones that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. This is the AMR for the boy wants the girl to believe that he likes her. So there's a wanting event, a believing event, and a liking event. And the, the wanter is the boy, the thing wanted is the believing, the believer is the girl, and the thing believed is the liking, and the liker is the boy, and the likey is the girl. Does that make sense? Okay, um, so it would be nice if we could build a semantics-based translation system, and here is a possible recipe for a semantics-based NT system. We start with the Chinese sentence, we parse it to form a Chinese tree, and then maybe we can interpret it into some kind of a uh, some kind of a meaning representation, and then generate a tree from that in English, and then again intersect it with an NREM language model and get some fluent English output. Um, I'm sure that if we actually build a semantics based MT system, it'd be more complicated than this, but it would be nice to have the tools that would at least let us build this prototype, and then we can work from there and try to make it uh, actually get a good blue score. So that would be great. So I'm going to talk about these two formalisms, data automata, which are like finite state graph machines, and HRGs, which are like context-free graph grammars. So the first part of the talk is on, going to be on data automata, and this is the result of uh, uh, the Johns Hopkins summer workshop from this past summer. Um, and uh, I was joined with a lot of people. Jeff Flanagan was also uh, took part in a lot of these conversations, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And so uh, this part of the talk is basically reporting on what we did uh, that summer. Okay, so data phenomena. Uh, the, uh, uh, the basic formalism looks like this. You have rules that, that say, if you've got a state Q, then I can create this little graph fragment, and then I can go into state Q and state Q. These states could be different if you want. So that looks a lot like a context-free grammar, right? Then I also have rules that, that say, if I have two states Q, then I can merge them together and generate this graph fragment that extends both of them simultaneously. So let's see how that works. We start with the start state, and then we rewrite this. And then we apply a rule that expands the second queue, and then we expand the second queue again to get that. So, so far that looks a lot like context-free grammar. And now we're going to start applying the merging rules. So the first merging rule merges the first and the third queue, and adds a boy. And then we, we're going to merge again the remaining two queues, and rewrite them with go. And we get our name. And the original formalism had constraints that um, guaranteed that you would only get a planar graph. But AMRs are definitely not planar. So uh, one of our visiting students at ISI, his name was Daniel Kranheim, he dropped this planarity requirement and basically said you could merge any two or three or four states anywhere in the graph. And that makes the formalism uh, quite a bit harder to deal with. But it's what we need in order to do AMRs. Is that clear? Are there any questions about that and how this basic formalism? All right, so here was the state of affairs uh, from Kamimura and Slutsky. Um, uh, this, this line is like, uh, uh, how complex are the patterns of co-reference that you can generate, so the re-entrancy. And I wrote local here because of this restriction that graphs had to be planar. And uh, they defined DAG and tree transducers, but all of these others were nodes. Then, um, after Daniel's time at ISI, and, uh, and afterwards, he, he extended this to be able to generate basically arbitrary DAGs. Um, he introduced a weighted version of the same formalism, but not probabilistic, so you can assign a weight, but there's no guarantee that the, uh, the weights of all the graphs will be something to one. Uh, he came up with the intersection algorithm, and he came up with the recognition algorithm, but it was a two to the end recognition algorithm, so we hope we can do better than that. And he implemented it, so the toolkit is called Dagger, you can download it and play with it. So where we are now is, uh, this summer we spent a lot of time trying to work out the probabilistic version, and we think we got it, although we're not 100% satisfied with it. We also worked out an algorithm for given an arbitrary DAG automaton generating a finite language. Can you um, add up all the weights of all the derivations? So that's, uh, or can you search for the best derivation? So this is an important tool for general processing of, of graphs like we saw with the McDonald's, McDonald's example. And uh, we worked out a recognition algorithm that uh, depends on K, which is the property of the input graph. But uh, if K is bounded, then it actually turns out to be a linear algorithm the size of the graph. So uh, we think that this algorithm could be uh, extremely practical. And we implemented this over the summer also. Okay, so I'm just going to give you the basic idea of how this recognition algorithm works. And to do that, we're going to go back to finite state automata. So if I give you a string, the cat's out on the map, and I want to know, does your weighted finite state automaton accept this string? 
then here's the naive way to do it. You can, um, you can say the machine is going to be at some state at each of these positions between the words. There's seven positions. So let's search through all the possible combinations of states. And for each combination of states, we're going to check that combination against the FSA to see if the FSA allows that sequence of states. Does that make sense? So since there are seven positions, the complexity of this algorithm is going to be Q to the seventh power, where Q is the state size of the finite state machine. And seven is the length of the string, so it's Q to the n plus one power. Okay. Does that make sense? But don't ever actually implement this. So if you actually want to do this properly, then you have dynamic programming to make it more efficient. Right? So instead of searching through all the possible positions, I can just search through the assignments of states to the first two positions. And I can see which one of those are OK according to the FSA. Once I've done that, I can forget about Q0. And then I can just look at the, the, the Q1s that were OK and match them up against possible Q2s. And then once I've done that, then I can match them, up, I can match them again. Q2 and Q3 and so forth and so forth until I get to the end of the string. And at no point am I ever looking at one or two states at a time. So this algorithm will run in time order of Q squared times n. Does that make sense? So this is for non-deterministic finite state automata. For deterministic, you just, you just run that automata. It's really easy. So this is for, for n and things. OK, so it's the exact same way with graphs, just harder. So the naive way to do it would be you would assign a state to every single edge in the input graph. And we look at all possible combinations of all states for all of the edges. And for each one of those combinations, then we can check the local bit of graph against the rules of the DAG automaton and see, um, is this valid according to the DAG automaton? And I guess we need to look for cycles and stuff like that too, but, but those are details. So this would be the naive way to do this, and the running time would be order of q to the n, where n is the number of edges of your input graph. So that's, that's not good. We don't want that. So we can play the same trick again. Uh, it's just a little bit harder to see how we're going to wind our way through the graph. Uh, in this particular case, you can start by looking at these four edges. We consider all the possible combinations of these four edges. Then having done that, we can forget about that edge and we can consider these four edges. Having done that, we can forget about those two edges and consider just these three edges. All right, and then once we've done that, then we will have searched through all the possible combinations effectively. Uh, but at no point do we ever consider more than four states, so this algorithm runs in time q to the fourth times n. Um, and so if, you, if you've studied uh, like Bayesian graphical models, mark out random fields, this should feel kind of familiar. So uh, the, the, the way that these states are being visited is related to the idea of tree width. So we, we form a, a, a kind of a, a graph that's related to this one, form a tree decomposition of that graph, and then the tree decomposition will tell us what's the order of uh, bags of states that we visit. Does that kind of make sense? Questions? Okay, so um, uh, the complexity of this algorithm is going to be q to the something times n, and that something is somehow related to the tree width of the input graph. So, an interesting empirical question is for the graphs that we're actually interested in, what's their tree width? And we did a study of that over the summer, and um, I was pretty surprised. The maximum tree width of an AMR out of 20,000 sentences is only four. So, one means you're a tree. Two means you have a, a, a single cycle, or no, you have any number of cycles. Three means you have like a square with uh, both diagonals in it. And then four means you have something complicated. But uh, I was really surprised that it actually doesn't get worse than four. It's quite good. So that suggests, uh, I'm skipping over some details, but that suggests that we can do recognition on real life AMRs in uh, Q to the k time, where k is some low number that's probably five plus a little bit. I'm thinking maybe six or seven. And then if you do beam search or something, this should be, this should be really, really reasonable. Um, and so this sentence that I showed you actually is, is the worst AMR in the AMR bank. I, there's like three or four sentences with this tree width. This is the shortest one. And um, they don't get any worse than this. So I think that's a very encouraging result. OK, so that's where we are now. Um, I, I, I haven't said anything about the probabilistic version. but. Uh, I thought it would be best to leave that out. There's a fancier version of the algorithm that I just showed you that could work on an arbitrary DAG automaton, not just a single input graph, but you just have a DAG automaton and you want to know um, what's the sum of all the paths through that automaton. And this is the algorithm that I just showed you, and um, it is implemented. Any questions? Yes? Is it the number of what? Um, it has to do with the complexity, like how tangled up the graph is. So uh, it's independent of the edge labels. Uh, 
really depends on the structure of the graph and how, it's not how many crossings there are, but how far away from being a tree is it. If it was a tree, it had tree with one. Uh, and then it, it just gets worse and worse from there. Yes? I'm not sure I got the email, but um, could you say something about how you sum through the graph? Uh, like, what is the topological sort? Is there a way of determining that? Um, so, oh, work? yeah, this is a good question. So we have to, okay, so in more detail, we're going to form what's called the line graph of this graph. So that's a graph whose vertices are the edges of this graph. All right, and so uh, uh, the details are not that important. And then we're going to form the tree decomposition of that graph. And that is itself an NP-hard problem to find the optimal tree decomposition. So that's bad news. But um, there are heuristics. You use branch and bound and some pure pruning heuristics. And um, it turns out to be super fast. So uh, I, I, I claim that the maximum tree width of the uh, 20,000 AMRs in the AMR maybe was four. We determined that by writing this heuristic. And the whole thing runs at 20,000 sentences finished in like 10 seconds. So it's actually really, really easy to determine uh, tree width for these kinds of graphs. Does that answer your question? Uh, but I was, I was hoping to avoid getting into a full de detailed definition of tree decomposition because like, it would take too long. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, that's the basic idea. Any other questions? Okay. So now we can move on to the second formalism, which is hyper-edge replacement graph parameters. And this is, uh, this is basically work that was presented at ACL 2013. And this is joint work with the ISI summer interns from 2012. So hyper-edge replacement grammar looks like this. It's a little more complicated than Dagatana. Um, if you're familiar with tree-adjoining grammars, though, it's extremely similar to tree-adjoining grammars. So you have rules that look like this. The left-hand side is a hyper-edge and the right-hand side is some graph fragment. And you have these black colored nodes, so this one corresponds to this one, and then so the solid black corresponds to the solid black. And this says, if I have a hyper-edge labeled X, then I can rewrite it with that graph fragment. And this, this guy goes where this guy was, and this guy goes where this guy was. Okay, so how does this work? We start with the star symbol, and then we rewrite it using a, a rule to get this graph fragment. And in this graph fragment, there's an edge labeled X, so that means I can rewrite it using this rule, so this x gets replaced with that right hand side. So the result is this graph here. It might not be that easy to see because the graphs kind of bend when you, uh, when you do the rewriting, but you can see that this right hand side is, is right there. It's like that. Okay, and this new graph has a y hyper edge in it, so I can rewrite it using this rule, and the result will be this graph. So, uh, the analog with tree joining grammars is that these are basically like footnotes. Except we can have more than one of them, and then the elementary trees are not elementary trees anymore, they're elementary graphs. Okay, does that make sense? Yes? Oh, uh, so you could extract them from something like the AMR bank. Uh, so you, you could do some kind of alignment procedure. Uh, one of the ISI students has, has ju uh, just published a paper at EMLP on how to do the alignment between a string and an AMR. And then you could use some generalization of uh, what we already do in MT to, to create these fragments based on those alignments. I think that's how I would do it. But then there's probably more than one way to do it. Uh, one of Dan Gilday's students, uh, Xiao Chang Peng, is also working on uh, HRG extraction using uh, somewhat different methods. Um, for now, I'm assuming that the grammar is given. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a research question of how to get a good grammar out of these things. Well, it's actually a research question of whether good grammars <laughs> exist. We're not, these are very powerful formalisms, but we're not sure that they're as expressive as we really, really want them to be. So the, 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 the fit between the linguistics and the formalism is still something that, that needs to be investigated. And whether, and if not, how can we modify the formalism so that it, it does do really well? All right. So hyper-edge replacement grammars. Um, only do local reentrancies. You can't make reentrancies that go from arbitrary places in the graph. It has to do with the nature of the formalism. Um, originally, there was no transducer version. There was a probabilistic version. Uh, there was no intersection algorithm. Uh, another paper did work this out. As I mentioned before, the original paper on parsing ADRGs just said it's polynomial, and they didn't say any more than that. So uh, the situation that we're in now is, uh, as I showed you before, we, uh, we've changed these nodes into yeses, and we've worked out an algorithm that uh, is polynomial, and the degree is bounded. Again, uh, k is related to the concept of tree width. 
So again, I'm just going to give you a basic flavor of this, how this algorithm works. Um, so in CFG parsing, the CKY algorithm, here's a naive way to do it. Um, we basically want to find all of the ways that you can match the right-hand side of a CFG rule against a string. And to do that, we can say, well, um, a rule with three non-terminals has four positions in it. And each of these four positions could be anywhere in the string. So we're going to search for all the possible ways that this right-hand side could line up with that string. Okay, so since there's four positions, we're going to end up with the uh, order ends of the fourth algorithm. So this would be a, a bad way of doing CFG parsing. And if I have a rule with 17 non-terminals, then it's going to be end of the 18th. So let's not do CFG parsing that way. Let's instead use the CKY algorithm, which says, um, let's only consider the first two non-terminals. Sorry, this is like generalized CKY or bottom-up these algorithm. Let's just consider the first two non-terminals in the, in the right-hand side. And we're going to consider all the ways that the, just those two non-terminals can line up with the string. Then once I've done that, I can forget about this middle position and think about the ways that these three positions can align with the string. Or if you want to, you can think of this as binarization. I can take this rule and convert it into, I can uh, decompose it into two smaller rules such that the two smaller rules only have two non-terminal symbols. Like Chomsky normal form. Right? And I can always do this with the CMG. So that means that at, at, at any point, I'm never looking at more than three positions at once, so CKY parsing is ordered and cubed. So with hyper-edge replacement grammar parsing, the idea is exactly the same, it's just harder. So um, I've got my input graph, and I've got the right-hand side of a rule, and there are four nodes in my rule. And I want to know what are all the possible ways that those four nodes could match up with nodes in my input graph. So that looks like it's going to be an end to the fourth algorithm. But we can do something analogous to binarization, and we can say, uh, let's just consider these three nodes. And after I've considered these three nodes, I can forget the middle one, and I can consider just these three nodes. And then I've considered all the nodes. And at any point, I've never looked at more than three nodes at once. So for this particular right-hand side, I've got an end cubed algorithm. For a more complicated rule, I'd have a, I'd have a, a higher exponent. Okay? So this is basically, basically binarization for HRG. And finding the optimal binarization is hard, but using zero six, it should be extremely easy. Okay, any questions? And there are, there are a lot more details to this algorithm. It's actually a, a very painful paper to, it was a very painful paper to write and a very painful paper to read, uh, going through all the details of the implementation. But uh, it's, all, it's all in the paper. Okay, so this is what our table looks like now. I think it's in pretty good shape. So um, these are the properties that we're interested in. And for both of these formalisms, uh, we have yeses in most of the cells. The future work would be um, this. So we, uh, we'd like to do more than DAG to tree transductions. We'd like to do DAG to DAG, tree to DAG. And that's going to require a lot more work to, to, to um, work that out. And I claim here that there's a probabilistic version of DAG automata, but this is kind of cheating a little bit because we had to change the formalism. So we work this out, but you can't get this and this at the same time. These two yeses. So. Maybe I should have made two separate columns. So you can have this or this, but as far as I can tell, you can't have both. But that would be a question for future research to see. Can we actually get both at the same time? Um, but uh, this is an excellent start, and it seems like we have all the pieces in place to actually start building a toolkit that hopefully people will do interesting things with. Like, uh, uh, could, you, uh, could you put together a bunch of data to make a semantic parser or a generation system or things like that? very close to being able to do that. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this turns out. Thank you, and uh, I can take any final questions. Solve. 
uh, we hook up these algorithms in the right way and see how it goes. Um, uh, yeah, it's definitely, definitely future. Context-free rewriting formulas are great because you can define a probability model over them. Because you, there's just one place where you do something, whether it's string rewriting or tree rewriting, whatever, and you know exactly what's the set of possibilities you can do at that point, and you can just make those probabilities sum to one. If I've got pairs of states, then it becomes much, much harder to set up the probabilities in a way that they sum to one. Because I don't know if there's two, like a rule can't apply if there's only one state available, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, especially if you have more than one state. So if I have a rule that's looking for a Q and an R and an S, you can only apply if there's a Q and an R and an S in the derivation at that particular moment in time. So it's really, really hard to make the probability sum to one. Um, so the way that we were able to get that yes is we changed the way that the merging happens. The merging became kind of a unilateral decision. So every single state um, decided uh, probabilistically what its referent was going to be. And if two states happened to choose the same referent, then they would become the same the same number. So because the def that, that decision became kind of unilateral, independent of all the others, then it became easy to define a probability model for it. Does that make sense? Okay, but then this summation algorithm, which I have not talked about at all, uh, a crucial step in the summation algorithm is, if I have a node, I want to know what are the sets of possible pairs of this node. And in that new formulation of the formalism, it becomes really, really hard to efficiently know what my possible sets of pairs are. And I think there's probably an exponential number of those sets. So um, you would get a really inefficient algorithm. That's the basic idea. But maybe we'll still find the right combination. So, just to maybe instead of probabilistic, Yes, um, yes. Right, so we're really happy with just weighted. So, uh, probabilistic means locally normalized. So at each local decision point, all of those decisions sum to one. But if I just want to do like a log linear model, maximum linear model, globally normalized, then that's fine. You just assign weights, and then you just put this one over Z in front. And you know, oftentimes these things perform better anyway. So I, I think it's extremely practical, even if we don't have a yes in that in that cell. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. So for uh, the entire key, there's a little sub title there about uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, is that a problem in practice? Or? I think it should not be a problem in practice. AMRs are always connected. Uh, if you were interested in like discourse semantics, then maybe, but. I, in the AMR bank, if they have multiple sentences, they just connect them with a pseudo root node. Uh, I'd have to think about whether we really are interested in, in disconnected graphs. Uh, if there were multiple components, then you would have a, I believe it would be a two to the C factor in the parts of complexity where C is the number of components. You just have to keep track of whether a component is present or not. And then the bounded degree is something that we're uh, intensely concerned about because the, the graphs in the AMR bank sometimes have very high degree. But bounded, of course, because it's a finite corpus. But um, there's a factor that I'm not showing you that's exponential in the degree, and uh, we need we need some kind of a clay star kind of mechanism to to eliminate that factor, which we think we can do, but that's also a topic for future research. Yes. The all the graph. No, uh, yeah, I, I use this term really loosely. Now, I wrote local up there in HRG, and what exactly did I mean by that? Do I mean that HRG is only generate planar graphs? And the answer is no, but it's my fault that, because earlier in the talk I said local and planar. Here, it just means that you can't merge any two arbitrary nodes. Um, uh, if, you, if you, maybe an example helps. So, if I look at an example HRG, if you look at the, the, the result graph, Every single re-entrancy in the result graph, so for example, boy has two parents, then there has to be a, a rule somewhere in which boy has two parents. And here, girl has two parents, and there has to be a rule somewhere where girl has two parents. So every re-entrancy has to be localized to some rule of the HRG. Uh, if, 
you're familiar with tree adjoining grammars, you know that like uh, it, it factors unbounded dependencies into local dependencies in a single elementary tree, and there it's a virtue. But here, I think it's a real problem. Uh, so if you want, if you have a really long sentence and boy is mentioned 23 times, then I'm going to need an HRG rule where boy has 23 parents in it. So that's just not practical. So we need we we need some kind of extension to the formalism to to make that possible. Does that answer your question?